Welcome back everybody. Let's go ahead and continue on with session one. This is the final part of session one. We are going to be jumping into the liability and equity section of the balance sheet and we're going to start covering some of the bigger ratios that you need to consider on your balance sheet. So let's go ahead and continue on with the liabilities. So now we're up to accounts payable. Now this is the first liability on your balance sheet account down the liability section. And the reason being is it's usually the one that's going to be paid the quickest or soonest, i.e. paid within uh, 30 days, 40 days, one year. And accounts payable is going to be made up of what we call trade payables. The payables that are truly related to the operations of your company. So if you buy a product from a vendor, yeah, and you're going to buy it on credit, it's going to go in your accounts payable. And you know, if you're buying a service that helps you with your business, it goes into your accounts payable. It's important that you have just operational type items in your accounts payable because as you're going to see when we do some of these ratios, we want to make sure we're comparing apples to apples and we don't have any other stuff mixed in there. Now within accounts payable, just like all the other balance sheet accounts, you want to reconcile the, the subsidiary ledger to the control account. So the subsidiary ledger and accounts payable is going to be the listing of all the people who, or, or businesses that you owe money to for services that you bought or products that you purchased. And the sum total, you add all those up, should tie back to your control account on your balance sheet. If it doesn't, and it's not uncommon that it doesn't, but if it doesn't, it's usually because there was a journal entry or a misposting somewhere that hit the control account, um, or somehow a release happened within the account's subsidiary ledger that didn't hit the control account. Either way, you need to be able to reconcile that difference and figure out why it does or doesn't work. Um, again, in accounts payable, you also want to make sure that you have a policy in place or consider a policy on taking discounts. Now some vendors, that, even in this day and age, still will offer you like a 1% discount, a 2% discount if you pay within 5 days or 10 days. Um, historically that's always been called 210, um, 210 net 30. Net being 30 is you have to pay it within 30 days, but if you pay it within 10 days you get a 2% discount. I would highly suggest you uh, take advantage of those discounts. Because uh, keep in mind that discount, if you think about how it all flows through the income statement is 2% of whatever that invoice is, that's going to go straight to your bottom line. That's going to go straight to net income. So take advantage of those. Now, the next item, cash flow on outstanding payables, that could affect your decision to take a discount. You might be in a position where you know cash flow is you know tight because you're still waiting to get paid on your receivables, so you can't take advantage of the discounts, and that's fine. But if you do have the cash flow um, ability, then I highly suggest you take advantage of those discounts. Uh, and then cash flow of outstanding payables. Again, keep in mind that you know the longer you hold accounts payable, the longer you're going to have cash within the business. Now I know there are some businesses that you know do this, and it's, it's not illegal. But some businesses will purposely not pay their payables for 45 days uh, instead of 30 days or something along those lines. And that's strictly just they're managing the cash flow in their business. Uh, and you can do that as well. You know, if you're a seasonal company and you're, you know, ramping up for the season but you haven't quite started yet, you know, it's not, you know, the start, let's say the start of your season is September and you're in August and it hasn't quite ramped up yet, well, you know, you may take advantage of, you know, delaying on paying the payable. So that's one of the th things to keep in mind on accounts payable is um, the cash flow purposes. Now accrued liabilities. Now this is going to be kind of, remember how we said you know back here in accounts payable you know, th these were trade payables? Well in accounts or accrued liabilities these are going to be all the other payables that you have that aren't really related to your operations. And of course the biggest one here is going to be your accrued payroll. Now with accrued payroll, uh, the way, first off, the way you calculate accrued payroll is you want to take the pay rate or the payroll if it straddles uh, a month or a year end, usually a year end, and you say, okay, if I stopped business on December 31st, how much would I owe the employees? How much did they work up to that day that they would be owed? That would be what your accrued payroll is. And when you do accrued payroll, you want to record it at least once 
and then I highly suggest you don't touch that account until the next year end. Um, you could drive yourself absolutely nuts trying to accrue the next one and then reverse it and then accrue and then reverse and then you're just doing that all year and it's like what benefit are you going to get from doing that as long as you have the initial payable on the books because once you have your initial payable on the books you know assuming you didn't increase your employee headcount by you know 70 percent 80 percent then you really don't need to do it every single time um, now if you do have you know rapid expansion and you go from you know let's say you had 10 employees and now you're up to 30 employees then you might you know in the middle of the year do run an accrual to get the balance up there because what happens is once your employee level stays the same that accrual balance won't really change a whole lot uh, from year to year you know it'll go up or down depending on timing and raises and everything but once you have that balance there you, you pretty much are set for a, a good while now accrued vacation or paid time off now this is exactly what it says a lot of uh, companies have a policy where an employee will accrue um, PTO or, or vacation time and they can take it you know whenever and when they leave they get to take that you know they get the um, whatever accrual cashed out the important thing on this is set a cap limit on the vac vacation time. So if you're going to have a policy that says they're going to you're going to pay for vacation time, you know, if you leave, it's a it's not a use it or lose it policy. It's once you've earned it, it's yours. You need to set a cap limit because what employees will do is if you don't set a cap limit, you're going to have those employees who don't take a vacation and they just keep, you know, accruing, you know, building up their accrued PTO balance. Well, if you think about it, as an employee stays with you each year, every couple of years, they're going to get what? They're going to get a raise. And that hour that they earned, you know, two years ago when they're making, let's say, 20 bucks an hour, that, you know, and now they're making $22 an hour, well, you just add a 20, you know, $2 to that hour that they didn't take two years ago. So that's kind of the thought process in that is, is some employees will just save it up, save it up, save it up, save it up, put a cap policy in, say, something to the effect of um, you cannot carry more than two weeks vacation time over into the next year or something like that you know don't make it too onerous you know that you have to use it all up by, by December 31st because you're probably going to drive your employees away they're not going to want to be there but do put a policy in place that limits it or caps it um, so that you don't have those people that are trying to game the system on there and then interest payable you know, if you have uh, a note payable or sometimes line of credit, you're going to have interest that you're going to have to pay on it. And it's very similar to accrued payroll. You get to the end of the year, you know, December 31st, if you happen to quote, shut down the business on that day, how much interest on the note would you still have to pay? That's what interest payable is concerning. And again, that's a number that I would only suggest you change that once a year in December and then just let it sit there unless again you know your, your debt balance you pay off your debt balance completely or you um, uh, incur a huge amount of debt then you'll want to adjust it but if your debt balance is just going down by the standard monthly payments or bi-monthly payments or however the payment schedule set up I wouldn't adjust that interest payable account until you get to your end but it is important that you have it there at least at your end because you need to have an idea as to okay where is all my cash sitting or where does it need to go because you're going to see when we get to the current ratio it's going to affect that so now deferred revenue now some of you probably are going to have deferred revenue and in a nutshell what deferred revenue is is somebody you have a customer that comes in and they put a deposit down or they put their money down for your product but you haven't delivered it yet or you haven't done the service yet and so you get the cash and remember this is you actually get physical cash in or, or, or checks or something um, but you get funds in and you have not provided the service or the product yet so accounting rules say that that has to go in as a deferred revenue which is a current liability account now the way it gets released from deferred revenue is you provide the service or you provide um, uh, the product and then when you do that then you take it out of you know accounting entry wise you take it out for revenue and you put it into regular revenue what you need to make sure on this is that you keep a schedule of 
like a subsidiary schedule like you would on accounts payable of the deferred revenue. Now, not too many uh, programs, accounting programs, have a subsidiary ledger for deferred revenue. Some do, or some are starting to get them there, but they're, they're just not quite to the robustness that the AP ledger or subsidiary and the AR subsidiary ledger are. So you need to make sure you keep some sort of track on that, that you know, if you have multiple customers giving you deferred revenue, you need to have some sort of listing that breaks that out, and then that listing needs to tie back into the deferred revenue. Um, I've actually seen once when I did an audit of a municipality where they had these uh, uh, fees that contractors would have to pay um, when they're trying to set up a, a subdivision and when um, the subdivision was all done and the, uh, the um, municipality signed off on it then they would reimburse the funds back to the contractor and it would it would take a couple of years this wasn't like a quick process well when I was going through and auditing them I asked them to show me the detail of that account because it was a deferred revenue account and they could not provide it for me and my first question to them was well how do you know who you owe who and what you owe to each person and of course you know you have that blank stare because you're dealing with government workers at that point in time but in your business if you're getting funds sent to you ahead of time before you provide the service obviously it's a deferred revenue it's a liability account and you need to track it the reason why it's a liability account is theoretically if you don't provide the service you have to send the money back or if you don't provide the product you have to send the money back i.e. you have to give a refund so that's why you don't want to just drop it in revenue because if if you, there's a possibility that you didn't deliver the product and you haven't earned it yet and you have to send it back to the individual um, then you need to have that as a liability okay current liabilities so now we've pretty much gone through the current liabilities, you know, the AP, the accrued liabilities, the deferred revenue. Those are your main current liabilities. Now, whoopsie, went a little too far on that. Um, now, your current liabilities represent liabilities that will pay or come due within one calendar year. You know, it's important to know that your current liabilities are uh, uh, what they are and that they pay, play a key role in many of the ratios. So we're going to get into the current ratio now, but it was important for me to go through those the current liabilities and understand how to tie them out and how to make sure they're complete and accurate because now we're going to start seeing the power of the, the ratios. So don't fall asleep on me. I know I just sent you this slide on accident, but don't fall asleep on this because this is important stuff uh, and I know I use that, that term quite a bit, but I really want you to, to um, see all this that's coming up. So let's, let's go ahead and keep going on this. The current ratio. Now the current ratio is a very, very quick way to determine the health of your company. This ratio is predominantly used by banks, keep that in mind, um, when they're deciding whether or not to finance your operations. The current ratio is literally current assets divided by current liabilities. And a current ratio of 1 to 1 or higher is ideal. Less than 1 indicates there may be a problem. So think about that. If my <coughs> current assets and current liabilities equal one another. They're a one-to-one -one ratio. That means my current assets will pay off my current liabilities. You know, and so my AP, my payroll, my crude interest, so on and so forth. And then if you think about below one, well, below one would indicate, based on this formula, that you've got more liabilities than you have assets or current assets. And remember, current assets includes your AR. It doesn't just include cash. It includes your AR and your inventory. So all the stuff that you purchased with cash or had have cash tied up into, if it's less than your current liabilities, then there is a problem with your company, and we need to take uh, corrective action steps to make sure we we uh, uh, cure that. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, an example of the current ratio. So this is an example of a current ratio and I also have a cash ratio on here which we'll go over here in a little bit but I wanted to show you the current ratio first. In this situation, and these are just the numbers so you can kind of see how it flows through, in this situation this company has 97,000 in current assets, 92,000 in current liabilities. So their current ratio calculates out to 1.05 which again that means at least your current assets are bigger and so you can manage you know your liabilities. Same thing with the prior year. But what happens if we adjust this current asset number and we say um, we only have 89,000? 
well, your ratio just went below 1, which is not what you want. And what I've built into this template that you're going to have is you're going to see this uh, macro pop up. And again, it's, it's something to warn you that when you dump your numbers in, again, if you look at this, there's three numbers in here. One, two, three. You can input those in no time flat. You take them right from your balance sheet, you drop them in here, and then it can tell you right away, hey, you need to take a look at that current ratio because you have some liquidity issues um, that probably need to be addressed. So again, it's a simple little calculation, but it gives you a very high level overview of your your financial health. And again, that's what we want. We want to have kind of that high level to alert you. Then if you're already being alerted to something, then you can dive down to the more specific ratios so you can pinpoint where it is. Because again, when we go back to the levers of your business, we want to pull those levers to make sure that we get your business to where it wants to be. And if we know there's a lever broken, we need to go in and fix it or find out why it's broken so that we can fix it. We don't want to just let it you know, flop around out there because it could totally skew your company off course. And that's what we don't want. We want to make sure that you're successful in this and we want to make sure that you have the tools to alert you if something is amiss within your company. So now let's jump right back and take a look at the cash ratio. So the cash ratio, and some of you might not have heard of this particular ratio, but it's very useful um, in, again, determining the liquidity of your company. Um, it measures how much of the current liabilities can be paid with cash in the company. And like the current ratio, one, or one to one or higher is optimal. So in the, this ratio, this is going to say, what is your cash plus any CDs, um, if you have any certificate deposits or marketable securities, um, any kind of liquid investments, i.e. investments that, you know, if things get tight, you can just immediately pull from and you don't have to, you know, call a broker and it takes five days for them to sell the mutual funds and that type of stuff. You know, it, it's something that's pretty liquid um, and you can get at to or get to pretty quickly. So you add those two together and you divide by your current liabilities. Now, again, the calculation below one should alert you that you may need to infuse cash into the business. It doesn't mean, necessarily mean your business is struggling. It may mean that you as an owner might have to infuse cash back in. You might have to make a comp capital contribution. Um, I've seen this situation where um, small business where the company was making money and the owners were you know liking the fact they're making money so they just start pulling money out to use for their own personal things which against their company but when we ran this ratio, we started seeing that they had pulled too much cash out and they weren't going to be able to cover their liabilities. And that was just strictly because they had just pulled more distributions out um, than they probably should have. And so this is a great ratio for you to, one, see do you have enough liquidity in there to cover your current liabilities? And two, it also gives you an, a uh, an avenue to say, okay, do I have enough cash? Now, remember, we're going to go over the 30% cash rule um, in another module. but with this, you can also use this to make sure you don't pull too much out for distributions. Because a lot of times, you know, as a small business owner, you start making money, seeing the cash build up, and you're like, well, how much can I pull out? Well, this is a quick little way to say, okay, I definitely don't want to go below one on this calculation. And then I also want to make sure I have, you know, 15 to 30 percent in the, the cash ratio or the um, cash reserves that we're going to definitely want to have so but this is one of those kind of higher level calculations that we want to see so let's go back and take a look at uh, the template so here we are back in the template and here's the cash ratio and so this is why you know when we were looking at the current ratio I had these extra items up here is just so that we could have both these ratios at the same time uh, and just makes life easier because again it's just one extra number so let's go ahead and, and make stuff as efficient as we possibly can so in this situation this company has $95,000 cash, $92,000 in current liabilities. Right now, they're they're doing pretty good on their cash ratio. You know, I mean, they, they have more than the liabilities. Now, yes, you want to be above one or 100% in this case, um, but uh, but obviously you want to be even higher. But one, at least you can cover your current liabilities. So let's see what happens when we reduce this down to 91,000. And again, we go below the one, and then we get this alert within your template that says you need to address this or consider um, infusing cash fairly soon or immediately or somehow come up with the, the cash because your current liabilities are going to be coming due and you're not going to have the funds to, um, to uh, or at least the cash funds, to go about fixing that. So, 
So that's kind of how those work. And again, these are very important. And the beauty of this, these ratios, you can put these on your, your balance sheet. Um, now in QuickBooks, QuickBooks might not let you bring it in there, but with QuickBooks and with the other softwares, you can usually export the balance sheet into an Excel, and then you can just drop these numbers right in there, and so you have everything sitting right there in front of you, and you have those automatically linked, and then you know you can month to month analyze and see these this information and and, and have some comfort. And again, remember these are higher level. Um, ratios. We're going to get into more detailed ones soon, but these ones are the top level ones that you look at and get an idea as to, okay, am I, am I going in the right direction? Um, and again, this cash ratio, banks like to look at this, so keep that in mind is, you know, if you're going in for a loan at both these, if you're sitting going to go into the, the bank and, you know, these numbers are below one, these are below one, just be prepared for them to say, well, I'm going to need more collateral or you're just not where we want you to be. These are the couple numbers that they're definitely going to be looking at. So so let's go ahead and jump into notes payable. So notes payable. Just like fixed assets, um, you want to have a roll forward schedule. Um, but this one's going to be a little unique and I, I, when I bring it up you'll understand. You also want to have an amortization schedule um, because when you take out a note, you know, you're not paying you know, even principal amount on the note as it goes down. You're paying an even payment amount, and that payment is split between principal and interest. And so when you take out a note, you want to make sure the bank gives you an amortization schedule. Now, if they don't, there is a quick and easy way to do it in Excel, uh, and I'll show you that to you. But again, you have to have Excel to be able to do this. So if you're on Google Sheets, I don't believe Google Sheets um, allows you to, at least the last time I checked, they may have updated that. But um, definitely within Excel, I can show you a really quick, easy way to do an amortization schedule. But have your bank give it to you first, because what can happen is the bank can come back and say, well, this is what your principal amount should be. And if you've been making the payments, you can literally pull out their schedule and say, no, per your schedule, this is where it should be. And so then it, it, it puts you in a stronger position. Um, also, in the uh, roll forward schedule, you're going to want to have a maturity because as you're making your payments, you want to know down the road how much do I have to pay in you know year three, four, five, six. Um, and also you want to know what the current portion is because again that's a current liability that you need to consider when you're doing your current ratio. So let's go ahead and jump into the roll forward template real quick. So here is a standard roll forward schedule. Now it's going to be vertical versus the horizontal one that you saw for the fixed assets and the reason being is how everything's going to flow through and it'll make sense as we go through this. So in this particular situation um, you want to at first at the top part of this schedule that you build is you want to have all your notes. You know, if you have a car loan for Chevy, a car loan for Ford, um, no payable for equipment, whatever, you want to break each one of those out. Then you want to make sure you indicate what the initial loan amount was, a date of loan, interest rate, terms, very important, collateral. What is collateralized against this note? Uh, as you can see here, I said this one was equipment, this was none, so it's uncollateralized, building, and inventory. Now. When you're doing um, debt, and in particular line of credit, you don't necessarily want to have your accounts receivable attached to the debt if you can avoid it. Now, if you if it's just a situation where the bank needs more assets and you don't have anything besides the accounts receivable, then you can probably, you know, you, you're, you're kind of stuck with that. But ideally, you really don't want the bank to have collateral control over your receivables because that can just become an a, um, administrative nightmare uh, and there's going to be a lot of back and forth with the bank when you're dealing with that situation. So um, inventory is usually pretty fine. That's usually a mundane one um, but again that one could um, rise up if there are certain uh, levels that they indicate you need to maintain. So but either way when you need to list out your collateral, even though you know, personally you know this, uh, if you're going to have an accountant or somebody jump in and, and start helping you with this stuff, they're not going to know what these notes are attached to, so that's why it's important to keep the schedule. Then of course, the monthly payment. What is the monthly payment that you're going to have to make on these respective notes? So in this situation, I said these three notes were established um, you know, obviously prior to 2019. So here were the balances 
at the beginning of the year. Now these are the principal balances. This is if you were to pay off the loan, this is what these balances are. And again, these are going to come from your amortization schedules. Then you want to list out any draws, any new loans, and you want to list that out at the exact amount that it went in. So in this case, I said, took out a, a mortgage of $15,000 in 2019. So here we go, $15,000. Now your principal payments. So all the payments you made during the year that were principal, i.e. that reduced the note payable, you want to list it out between, against all these. Because this these amounts here should tie to your amortization schedule assuming you made all your payments. Uh, and then that will tie or should tie to your general ledger. And again, you're going to tie this back to your general ledger. This, think of this as kind of the subsidiary ledger for your notes payable. You're going to end up tying this amount and that should tie back to your notes payable both for this amount and for the current portion. So come down here with each note when you take out a note take the time to put this together um, because at some point in time you're gonna have to do it and, and hopefully none of this changes you don't have some weird balloon payments but um, this this amount should stay the same as you go through so you're gonna list out and you're gonna take it right from the organization schedule how much principal payments am I making in the next year and the next year so on and so forth and list it all the way out to the very last payment reason being is this gives you an idea if you look over here how much cash outflow you're going to have regardless of interest how much cash outflow you're going to have in the next upcoming years and so you want to make sure you have this idea you know looking at a number of 76,000 yes yeah, so that's a big number but if you break it out like this you then understand what your cash flow issues are going to be so in this situation if you look here in 2023 this individual is going to have quite a bit of cash outflow that they need to do um, of 10,187 so that's important to keep in mind as you're looking through um, and going through this process Again, that's principal, so your actual payments are going to stay the same, but this is indicating how much your principal payments are going to go down over those years. So let's take a look at an amortization schedule real quick. So in Excel, when you go to File and you click on New, it's going to pull up all these little templates that you can use. Well, right here, and because I've used it recently, it's popped up here, but it'll be down in here, is a loan amortization schedule. So Go ahead and click on that, and then it brings up a nice little loan amortization schedule. So in this situation, all you have to do is fill out this information, and it'll do the calculations for you. So let's just real quickly assume we took out a $37,000 loan and interest rate of 9%, and number of payments a year. In this case, right now, it's just calculating one year. So this is how much you would pay every month to pay off 37000 a year, but let's say it's a five-year loan. Then it goes and it'll do the calculation for you, and this is, again, what amortization schedules look, look like. So here is the balance um, as of this period. So after that first uh, payment, principal payment, this is what you owe. This is what you owe so on and so forth. So this is what an amortization schedule will do. And you'll want to do this, again, get the one from the bank first. If the bank does not supply it, then go ahead and um, you can do this in Excel. And again, you just come up to File, go ahead and get New, and then go ahead and go into Amortization Schedule. Um, but this is a nice, handy-dandy, quick little way that you can go ahead and get this um, put together. So, so let's go ahead now and go into Equity. So equity. Remember when we talked about equity and reconciling equity? That is one of the biggest things and hardest things for a new business person to do, but you need to do it. And again, it's because it'll help you catch any errors that get post-dated or anything that goes askew within your financials. A lot of times it'll hit your equity account, so that's why it's very important to go ahead and reconcile your equity. So you're going to do a roll forward schedule. Keep in mind, equity, you take the net income and you close it out to equity every year, and you only do it once a year. Uh, remember when I said that sometimes people like to say they close their books every month, but well, they don't really close their books. So a true closeout is you take the net income or loss and close it to the equity. 
Now it's important when tying out equity um, will help you catch post-dated adjustments and in invoices. Again, if you're in 2019 and your bookkeeper gets an invoice in and it says something about being 2018 services, I've seen it more times than I can count, where they'll go in and they'll input the invoice as 2018. Well, your accounting software, especially if it, it's like QuickBooks or Zero, will then dump it into 2018. Well, if you've already closed out your books, you've already reconciled your equity. If they go and do that transaction, they now adjusted net income in 2018, and that's going to mess up the equity. So remember how we went through that earlier. So um, again, that's the big key and important on tying that out. Close out your distributions every year to your equity accounts. Now, when you take a distribution, put it in a separate account in the equity area. So you'll have one account, let's say account 3,000 for your capital account, and it could be 3,005 for distributions. Just use that for the current year distribution. So if you take $20,000 in distributions for the year, at the end of the year, that, that balance will be 20,000. When you close out your books, close that number out to the equity when, when, you're, when you are done closing out everything. The reason being is if you just use it as a um, uh, accumulation of your distributions, it gets harder to tie out your equity because you always have to remember, oh, I've got to back out last year's distributions first. That's why I say just, just close it out. Um, sometimes, a lot of times what I've seen most people do is they will close it out January 1st. And, and that the reason being is, you know, from January 1st through December, you'll have distributions. And then January 1st of the next year, um, they close out those distribution account to the equity account. And that's usually the safer way so you don't mess up anything else. But that's why you want to go ahead and do that. Now, there are different terms depending on what kind of uh, company you have set up. Now, if you have a partnership, it's called members equity. Corporation, retained earnings, a partnership, uh, LLC, you can also be partners capital. Now, the easiest way to remember all this is if it says Inc. in the name, it's going to be retained earnings. So Inc. is going to be incorporated, you're going to have retained earnings. Otherwise, you're going to have members equity or partners equity, you know, depending on how you want to describe it, but uh, the key is just remember that because you will hear the terms retained earnings or you'll hear it called members equity. They're one and the same, but it's just a distinction on what kind of structure the business is in. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at the equity reconciliation. Again, short and sweet, we take the ending equity from the previous year, so with the equity that, you know, with the net income every closed at, all closed out, you then close out your distributions, you close out your net income, you come up with your ending equity uh, as of the end of, in this case, 2019. So this number, as of January 1st, 2020, should best, uh, that number in your equity account should be this number. If it's not, then you have an issue flowing through on one side or the other. Again, when you get to January 1st, get to January 1st, 2020, this number from your equity tie-out should be that number on your GL. If it's not, then you need to go and figure out why that didn't roll forward. Again, sometimes it's because something happened to net income at some point in time and it messed up the equity. So, so that is what um, tying out the equity section is. So now we are completely through the balance sheet. In the next section, in the next section, we will go ahead and go into um, the income statement, and we'll start diving down more into the ratios and into the more of the key operation ratios within the, the income statement and go through that. But again, these sessions or these parts of this session for the balance sheet are important because it helps you tie out the balance sheet accounts and helps you understand how to make sure your numbers are complete and accurate on the balance sheet. So. So I look forward to seeing everybody in session two where we're going to jump into the income statement. Thank you.